You're watching your local television network, TSPN. And now, authors, writers, books, and beyond. This program also streams live on the web at TSPNTV.com and can be watched on demand at TSPNTV.com or TSPN TV's YouTube channel. And now, authors, writers, books, and beyond. Hey, welcome to our August um, episode of Authors, Writers, Books, and Beyond. I'm your hostess, Kathy Boyd-Fuller, and it's lovely to have you back again. It's a rather warm summer day here in Jackson, California. Thank you for joining us. I have wonderful guests. Today we're going to be doing something new. At our halfway break, um, one of our guests will be switching off with another. So. Um, see what you uh, think of that. I would actually like to hear back from you on that little plan we're trying out. So I'm going to begin the show with introducing you. On my right here is the lovely poetess Kathy Isaac Luke. And on my left, Ralph Sanborn and Pam Mundell, all authors. And I'd like actually to start with Kathy sharing. Kathy um, brought three books to talk about. And if you're going to read, I didn't know if you did want to read a snippet. Oh, of course, yes. you know I would love it. Okay. Thank you, Please. Kathy. Shall I do that first? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to read a fabric from my collection, Chrysalides. Clotheslines are forbidden in our planned community. There must be no glimpse of intimate apparel, no hint that we perspire and need to press fresh water through the weave of our garments. But in the alleys of Barcelona, behind dwellings in Provence, Rectangular swatches of lemon, lavender, and fuchsia dangle from balconies, an inflorescence of blooms. As soon as we were tall enough, Annie and I helped Mama hang wash on parallel lines stretched across our backyard. Mama checked the afternoon sky for the condition of clouds. At the first sign of sprinkles, we ran to pluck the laundry and pile it still damp on the bed. On summer days, Annie and I made tents of pastel bedclothes, draping them over several lengths of wire. Inside our fabricated castles, we sat cross-legged on the clover, pretending we were holding court in Araby, or were Victorian ladies seeking shelter from the sun. Our woven walls smelled of ivory flakes. They rippled in the breeze. We had no idea they were unsightly. Isn't that lovely? That's one of my favorites. You want to tell them a little bit about that book? Uh, this is my uh, collection, Chrysalides. It was published uh, about two years ago. And um, it's, it's my first collection. I had been published in several anthologies and literary journals. But, um, this one is published by Dragonfly Press, which is a small press in Columbia. And I had a, it was a really interesting experience for me putting it together because it was a little bit different than just writing a poem that, you know, organizing them around a theme. And after several uh, uh, tries of making a decision, I chose Chrysalides, which is the title poem. And the artist who did the cover, um, which is this dragonfly, um, we were having a discussion about the life cycles of dragonflies and I was struggling with putting the book together and it just kind of fell together that I would organize it around life cycles and so of dragonflies but also human <laughs> life cycles so that's how I put it together in a kind of chronological order of childhood, youth, adulthood and aging. <laughs> okay, I like that. I want to share, you have a couple others there. Uh, I'll read the top, oh, oh, the other the books. books, okay, yeah. sorry. Uh, okay, this is an anthology, Cotton in Spirit, which um, I have several poems in. This, is, this was put together by my writing group. I lived in San Jose and uh, had a writing group for several years, and they're still going on, and sometimes I go, but it's a long commute. But uh, these, these are poems from all of us, and most of these ended up in here, in here. most of them, not all. And then this... What was the name of your group down there? It was called Peerless Poets, meaning we didn't have a leader. We, we, oh, we were all peers, okay. not that we were be without peer, but uh, 
that's what just what we called ourselves. And then this one is an anthology of women's writing called The Call, which is by Dragonfly <coughs> Press, which published my book, my uh, collection. In this, I have the first and only short story I have ever had published. <laughs> What's that called? What's the, title? The, the title of that short story is The Collection. The Collection? I don't think I've heard that, have I? I'm probably not, because so. it's kind of too long to read it a poetry reading. Yeah. But it's a it's a short, short story. Nice. Thank you, Kathy. Well, thank um, you. I'm going to go to the left here and let um, Ralph and Pam tell you a little bit about themselves, too. You want to start off, Ralph? Well, sure. I um, have just published my first book. It's uh, a debut novel, and uh, it's called uh, China Red. China Red is uh, the street name for a heroin product produced in China and uh, smuggled into the United States. And the hero is uh, Caleb Frost, the protagonist. Uh, he uh, sort of came to me. Um, most of my characters sort of walk in the door, and, and <laughs> I find that is the most exciting thing about writing fiction is the door opens and yeah. then walks somebody and you have to deal with them and they've got backstory and so forth. Well, Caleb, uh, his parents were killed by assassins and his parents' controller convinces him to become an assassin himself and find the killers of his parents. Oh, okay. So that is the underlying theme, although uh, we have motorcycle gangs, and we've got restaurants in New Orleans blowing up and things like that that are a lot of fun. Um, so for the audience, can you give your genre? So that oh, it, it's a um, fast-action-paced thriller. Okay, a thriller. And uh, that was, uh, it was named a thriller. I submitted the book, and they said, oh, it's a thriller. And I said, all right, that's what it is. Oh, okay. But it's got a lot of action. And... Um, my background, at least in education, was in psychology. So some of my characters seem to be slightly fouled mm. up. You mean you that know? way? Oh, okay. Yeah. And they need that a makes them fun. That makes them fun. And uh, I've got a lot of good women characters in Strong there. Strong females? Strong females. They're all are assassins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so very strong. And um, but they're a lot of fun, too. So. It's, uh, I think it's a good read, and I've gotten good response. Good. You tell us a little bit more about it in a few minutes. Sure. Okay. And Pam, um, I I would like to introduce Pam again. She is one of the most prolific literary writers I've ever known. I love. I have the honor of critiquing her work, and um, it's beyond amazing. So I'll let you take it from there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of my uh, Writing is uh, actually set in um, in California. The most recent book I'm working on is it's uh, it's the second book, and it's about a, a young woman. She's in her 30s who uh, kind of hits a life transition point. Uh, she is uh, she's a Wiccan, practicing Wiccan. Uh, she moves back to Santa Cruz, back into uh, her old um, friends and actually her ex-significant other. Uh, she goes on a, a quite a number of, of soul-searching adventures and tries to rediscover herself during the course of the novel. It's, um, it's difficult to explain. The novel's got a lot of um, a lot of wedding with place, so there's a lot of ocean scenery that comes into the story, mm -hmm. a lot of bonding with the ocean, bonding with um, with the uh, sort of the environment or wherever her, her head is at in the, at the time. And so it's a, it's a real journey. It takes a while to write these books because you go pretty deep. Yeah. I look at a lot of uh, poetry. I look at a lot of writers like Updike's, um, especially his uh, book Centaur, for so, sort of for inspiration and where to take that um, story. It weds um, the mystical path or the mystical, 
mythological path with her own past her own past and kind of weds them together and so the big question that the book asks finally is whether or not you really can escape yourself um, and your memories and what your memories make you become okay wow deep <laughs> yeah, yeah my kind of book <laughs> um, before we go on our first break I would like to bring up obvious difference in our genres any of you viewing know I've I've shared before I write um, illustrated children's books and I'm also a novelist so you have a wide spectrum here of genres which is um, offering you uh, a different viewpoint on what you may read sometimes thinking about trying out something new to go from literary to thriller I'm contemporary women's and Kathy's an amazing poet so I, I really enjoy the difference um, I also enjoy um, when we're writing some of us critique together some of us workshop together we all go to Gold Rush writers retreat and so what you get in the books comes from all of that together you know not just the individual so with that, I'm going to prepare you for our first break and um, hope you will come back and join us. There's a lot more to hear about these stories. You're just scratching the surface here in the beginning. I'm glad that you did join us and look forward to seeing you again. Thanks very much. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. You're watching your local television network, TSPN, and now back to authors, writers, books, and beyond. This program also streams live on the web at tspntv.com and can be watched on demand at tspntv.com or TSPN TV's YouTube channel. And now back to authors, writers, books, and beyond. Hi, welcome back. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to start you off with... Uh a little uh, background on the bookstore next door, Heinen Company. Um, Two-story wonderland for writers, readers, that's amazing. You can walk through rows and rows of bookshelves all day. You could actually spend the night. Um, there have, they have extended their inventory to include clothing for plays and props and, oh my gosh, they have all the old record albums and videos and video games and um, you can go upstairs and never come down actually I used to take my homeschool my kids there when I homeschooled and they're getting ready for Baker Street West I think the opening date is still sometime in September for a murder mystery theater so it's offering lots of new opportunities writers groups meet there workshops Sarah Luck Pe Pearson leads a nonfiction workshop there that's her group there right now. And just a wonderful place to go find books. And, and Wolf is really good about carrying local books, too. So I'd like you all to say where you're from. Kathy? Oh, I'm from, New, uh, from Louisiana, from Baton Rouge in New Orleans. And Ralph? Well, I'm from, right now I'm from Burlingame, California. But I'm an East, Easterner, basically. Easterner. <laughs> New York, Philadelphia. Oh, okay. And Pam? And I'm a resident of Mountain Ranch. Originally, I came from um, Ohio. Like my husband. Yeah. Well, Kathy is going to let us just sit and listen quietly to another read, and this is really a wonderful treat. Thank you. I'll read the title poem from the book. It's called Chrysalides. Even in the summer, with its palpable heat, our petticoats were starched, so stiff they stood alone. At night they crowded round our bedrooms like phantom flowers, giant brittle blossoms inverted for a dried bouquet. In mornings they were layered over wire undergarments and garter belts so tight they cut into our thighs. Then swollen and distorted, we conspired with one another at a distance. Before Elvis shook his shake and little Richard sang of girls named Sue and Daisy, boys huddling in corners wondered how to scale the walls of our domed fortresses and dreamed of peeling back stiff petals 
of crinoline and net. Aware of dormant music, we were restless in our strange cocoons. Our skirts whispered as we walked. <laughs> Good. Lovely, thank you. Right. And can you just share a little bit about why you write poetry? Um, I write poetry, first of all, I'm not very prolific, so uh, I like concise things that I can finish, and so it gives me a sense of satisfaction to finish things. And I really like playing with language. Mm -hmm. And I actually started out writing short fiction, and I still do that. But um, I, I enjoy writing poetry because I can do metaphor and and just do things that I can't do in fiction and try to uh, crystallize an image and that's very satisfying to me. Plus, as I said, um, that I can finish them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so... Finishing is good. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> and I have many short stories that are <laughs> not finished that are, you know, still in progress. So. And how long have you been writing? Uh, probably well since I was a child I used to I used to write poetry and as a child and also some short fiction and then when I it came time for me to graduate from high school I needed to have a job where I could actually support myself and mm -hmm. and my parents sort of uh, encouraged me to go into nursing this is like in the 60s and there weren't a whole lot of professions where a single woman could uh, was were a, you know, could enter. So I chose nursing. I was very glad that I did. I met wonderful people. I ha I got to travel, mm -hmm. and I until I met my husband, I was that was my career. And um, but I always wrote, and I just didn't think of publishing, publishing. It until until my daughter got out of high school. I started sending things out, and surprise, some people actually took them. Yeah. So isn't that wonderful? Yes, yes. <laughs> That part's lovely. Yes. <laughs> that kind of leads into what I'd like to talk about is the publishing. We live in the world where the traditional publishing world has is still changing daily. It's much altered than it ever was before. And Indian self-publishing um, is not the does not have the stigma it used to have. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I agree. Well, I, you know, in my opinion, one reason why I indie published is that I wanted to get, you know, China Red out there and maybe get some response to it financially. But if you look for an agent, it's going to take you about six months to find one. It's going to take them about six months, if you're lucky, to sell your book to a mainstream publisher. And the publishers take a year and a half to bring it to market. So you're talking about two and a half years from submitting a manuscript to getting, getting it out. And then you have to go through the same thing again with your second book. Mm -hmm. So I felt the pressure of time. I think we all do. Time, mm -hmm. time has changed from, mm -hmm. I've been in it 20 years, and it's dramatically altered. What about you, Pam? Um, I'm still trying to go the traditional route uh, with an agent and a regular publishing house. It's it really when you see your friends around you publishing, of course, it it sort of makes you feel like I don't have anything out there yet. You know, I don't have books to hold up. I um, I'm still, you know, tweaking and and working on two novels. I have two others that I'd like to get started on. Um, I, f I feel for me it's still the right decision, although um, I may have to make another choice in a year or two if nothing happens. happens. Yeah. And, and as you and audience land know, I do have a literary agent, and she's wonderful. I am blessed to have her, and she um, is the one that shops my books everywhere. And it's different because I also am watching everyone around me. Their novels are coming out. My children's are out, but Wendy represents my novels. And so um, it's a different world. It, it is. is. It is for agents, too. It's all through the publishing. World. You know, the writing is easy. Yeah. It's the business part, which is a pain. And for us, see, we're not technically all businessmen or women. Yeah. Yeah. I had to learn to market the children's and that was new for me. I'm not a salesperson and I don't know about you but I just want to write. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah, me too. And social networking now. Oh. That I'll let you start that one. Crazy. <laughs> what do you think about that? Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, you, you, you're relying on Amazon nowadays <coughs> yeah. to really spread the word, make your book available. But you've got to bring people in. And whether you like tweeting, whether you like Facebooking, it's a necessity now because uh, you can build friends, you can build a, an a audience, but you're going to have to do it. And doing it means almost every day. Mm -hmm. you, you tweet something. Do you limit your time daily? I put in probably an hour and a half a day on social Media. Media. What about you, Kathy? I I have a blog. I don't write on it that often, and I'm not sure if anyone ever sees it. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not on Facebook because I would rather be writing. I find it very time-consuming to be on social media, plus the emails and you know all the mm -hmm. other things that you have to keep up with. So I don't have Facebook, and I enjoy reading other people's blogs and and um, I do too. very much. But I don't plan to expand my uh, efforts in that area anytime soon because I have my time is limited and I want to write. <laughs> and you want to write. What about you, Pam? Um, I'm trying to do a little bit more of the social media because I know that that's what agents and editors are both looking at. And they do. Yeah. Yes. We went to Squaw Valley and we just heard some very, very interesting big numbers discussions. Huh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Those panels were very helpful. Yeah. They really were. Mm -hmm. it, you know, we write, and I have a, you were asking me how much I write, and it's more word count, because I will do so much, I, 10 minutes on Pinterest um, to build up my pages, my, my character pages for my novel, and so much for more Twitter and Facebook than I rarely email anymore. You do a lot of Facebook. Yeah, I do a lot. Good. It's one right. reason my agent took me. Really? She said she stayed in my Facebook presence, uh -huh. hmm. well, and so I have a responsibility there. And then I do blog, but not a lot. So, and are you bloggers too? I'm blogging uh, one or two a week, and uh, wow. really, I'm just getting started with this. But um, mm -hmm. I don't find it all that demanding, <clears throat> and I I enjoy it. I don't do serious stuff. A More humorous. Comedic oh, I like that. Side. So, and uh, a little sarcasm every time, <laughs> and things like that. And you know, I've found nice through my own writing, like with China Red, people, the publisher said, "Well, are you going to get anybody irritated?" And I said, "Not only China," <laughs> and um, which it really it hasn't, and it doesn't have that much to do with China. But um, you know, th that makes it interesting when you bring that sort of thing in. Into and you, it. Yeah, mm -hmm. as long as you're right. You know, yeah, you have to, have <laughs> you to have write. To right. That's yes. yeah. but, Do you uh, blog? Uh, I just started. Just started. Yeah. And Kathy, for as a poet, um, how much writing time do you put in? Uh, it just when I get inspired, uh, I'll go for a long time, and sometimes I'll go for breaks where I don't write at all. But the market for poetry is is very different, yes. uh, mm. and so even if I First of all, I wouldn't even know how one would go about getting an agent as a poet unless you had really made a big splash and were well known. Mm -hmm. uh, the market is even more challenging than the market market so for true. fiction, and the way you usually go about getting something published is to get a lot of individual poems published in literary journals or entering contests. That's and kind of the regular way to do it for a poet. We have to take a break. Yes. I want to thank Kathy for coming. Thank you. I really appreciate it and come back and join us. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. You're watching your local television network, TSPN, and now back to authors, writers, books, and beyond. This program also streams live on the web at tspntv.com and can be watched on demand at tspntv.com or TSPN TV's YouTube channel. And now back to authors, writers, books, and beyond. Hi, welcome back. We're going to um, 
I'm going to introduce you to June Gillum here in a minute, but first we're going to go into uh, uh, talking a little bit about where my group meets at Clark's Corner and I own. Wonderful um, establishment founded by Craig Clark, amazing entrepreneur. He has brought to a rural community a little bit of everything. We have boxing and literary reads and, oh my goodness, every genre in live music you could imagine, belly dancing. Mm. And Sundays, the churches have had their gigs. His food is amazing, and um, you can even get some gluten-free things there if you request it. So not just specialty coffees, they also sell wine, and they have Prime Rib Monday, first of the month. So give them a try, and you might see um, the amateur writers there when you go. I'd like to introduce on my right here, um, Kathy um, has stepped out and let June come in. And we all know each other, by the way. This is June Gillum. And um, can you introduce yourself, say a little about your background and your books? Well, I was glad to hear that you were working on the theme of poetry and fiction yeah. for this. Because I started out as a poet. You did too. I started out as a poet, and in my house, we had a lot of poetry and we had a lot of ideas. But we didn't have any stories. And we didn't have any conflict because my mom was Christian Science, and in Christian Science, everything is good and harmonious, and there aren't any bad things that happen to people. <laughs> I mean, there are, but you don't talk about them. You just don't talk <laughs> about it, okay? They aren't really real. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I started out as a poet, and you had asked us about a word that described us yes. as a writer. I think it so works. I thought my word would be a minor. A miner. Mining in the dark because oh. I was raised with so much brightness and goodness and light that I felt the need for balance. Mm. So um, I started out as a poet kind of mining into the dark. And the first book of poetry that I was in is called From the Mud to the Pie. So it's mm -hmm. a lot of women scrambling around in the mud. You can see she's kind of like a miner in a way there. Mm -hmm. So this was back in 1980. Oh, you've been writing a while. This was the Feminist Writers Guild. It was a national organization. You know Helen Bonner, don't you? I do, I do, <laughs> I do. Of her second eye. Yes, so this was a feminist organization, and uh, we created this book of poetry. And because it's a uh, 50th anniversary, anniversary of Martin Luther King's yeah. speech, I have a poem in here I'd like to read. Uh, I have a dream? No. It's not the I have a dream. Go ahead. Is it yeah. a short poem? It's just a short poem. Okay. It's a short poem. Don't and wait. it's it's related to back in 1980, even though it was um, 17 years after the March on Washington, yeah. uh, we were still hiring housekeepers and child tenders at a dollar an hour. And so this is a poem called Pride. And it's about my housekeeper in 1980. It could be called Black Pride. Pride. When she was young, she used to pick more Texas cotton in a day than any man in the field, she bragged with a black cackle. And once she killed a man in a barroom fight. So her husband never messed around on her. <laughs> no, sir. She grinned black and white spaces, satisfied waiting for him to pick her up from nine hours waxing floors and watching children at a dollar for each hour slaved away. Wow. wow. Hard to believe, you know. Isn't that amazing? It's very amazing. A dollar kind of an hour. Forget what it was before. Actually, I'm going to switch real quick because Pam writes about the music scene I do. in yeah. um, England. Uh, no, it's in the it's in the U.S. that uh, there are some British musicians in the story, and mm -hmm. it's mostly set in uh, Cincinnati in the late 1960s, mm -hmm. early 1970s. Um, although there is some touring involved, and it's about a young girl who finds her way into the rock and roll scene and the rock and roll bubble, and gets herself into a number of fixes. Um, her worldview becomes very unreal. Uh, she struggles to find some reality. 
and to find love, and she really doesn't find love. So it's really a, a struggle uh, to find herself and to find where she belongs in the world. Very much preserving a period in history mm -hmm. like your poem does, and actually your modern history. Yeah, this is modern, and um, what I've found be very interesting is when your hero is an assassin, you have to make the people he assassinates very, very bad. Wow. And so what I've done is I've gone into, um, in, in China Red, it's the Chinese government that is oppressing the uh, Muslims. And uh, in the next book that I'm working on, it's uh, the foibles of the Japanese and some of their laws regarding uh, human trafficking. During what time frame? Right now. No. Today. Today. And uh, the Correct. interesting thing is that, as I said, the publisher had said, is anybody going to be angry with you? <laughs> you know, they're not really angry because this is fact. This yeah, is not, simple fact. Yeah. So I enjoy using these truths in creating the characters mm -hmm. that they are practicing some of these bad things. That's not a, the entire country, obviously, is not bad. but. These things exist. In, in that part. And I find people like it, that they will say, gee, that was interesting. I think people yeah. love truth. <laughs> yeah. I think we're drawn to truth. Um, I, I don't think we can help it. I'm going to ask you again, June, to share a little bit more. Can you just tell the audience a little about your background? Well, um, I'm a lifelong learner, and I wanted to learn how to get my poems from poetry into stories. So. Um, it was a long, long, hard road, actually, and I spent a lot of money trying to learn how to do that. Um, and I ended up writing Creating Juicy Tales, Cooperative Inquiry into Writing Stories. So that's how I learned with six other women how to create stories with conflict in them, my dissertation. Can't have a story yeah. without conflict. <laughs> Some people try. Yeah, yeah. So when, when I did get this published by the um, academic publisher, I didn't know they were going to charge $113 for it. <laughs> so that kind of um, turned me off on publishers, and yeah. it turned me in the direction of being my own publisher because I experienced having no control. I, I couldn't convince them to lower the price. That's a high price. Yeah, and so because then I called myself a writer, now, on my IRS forms, my Internal Revenue Service forms, you can you have to earn a profit in two years out of five. Yeah. So I had to. I felt the pressure of having to earn a profit. So I published my own poetry book, own poetry chapbook, and this is again writing into the dark poems from childhood's fall, and then I published Good a. Title thriller it's a thriller yeah. but it's really a suspense thriller yeah. mm -hmm. because it's got a slower pace than an actual global type thriller mm -hmm. and also it's in a small location it's in the San Joaquin Valley like Lodi and Stockton area. I remember critiquing it yeah I bought it <laughs> so did I Thank Thank you. It's good. yeah <laughs> that's quite see quite a variety sometimes writers are um, requested to stay within their own genre, you have the freedom here to go outside of your genre and explore mm -hmm. and offer what our readers, you know, readers, yes, readers will follow a certain poet like Kathy or you or a certain author, but they also look for, out, for new genres. I don't think all the readers I know, and they're avid readers, read in more than one genre. Some are nonfiction fiction, but you know, because mm -hmm. I'm always looking for a good book of poetry. That love is deep. I think a lot of people start that way and then kind of venture out. We all have, you have a work in progress too, don't mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. So we all have a work in progress. And I think Kathy does too, probably. We're all waiting for another book for her to bring out. That would be lovely. So um, what I'd like to ask you as writers, what if you could change one thing, what would it be? Just because today everything's changing at lightning speed. Oh, I know what I would change really fast, and that would be the emergence of the small presses that 
basically vanqu were vanquished by the large press. Before. Yeah. And now we need them mm -hmm. because we have so many good writers out there that are unpublished and undiscovered. And if those small presses were still there the way they used to be, we'd see a lot more breadth and literature, I think. That's something the Squaw community of writers has always promoted is the small presses do. Yeah. I mean, they have the, the big publishers out, but they also have always promoted, and the small presses do. I work for a small press, and fans need a writing press. Um, I think they're the lifeblood of America, and I would also like to see that um, move up a little. What about you, Sandy? Well, you I'd coattail on, on what Pam said. Um, I like the idea there should be more presses available to writers. There. I am frustrated by the life that an agent has to lead, and they have to lead this. I know agents get 800 manuscripts uh, every month or so. Well, they call it the slush pile, and your manuscript goes in there, which you've sweated blood over, and it sits there. Uh, and it takes so long to get somebody to say, I like what you've done, and now that's a reality. And I can't go to fantasy, but fantasy would be the opposite of what the situation is right now, that you'd have a lot more publishers looking for material. That's true. And again, and you know, what would I change? Maybe get people to uh, read. You yeah, know? I think people are still reading. I'll have to come back to you after break, but I will start with you. There's a lot of readers out there, a lot more electronic readers. Um, baby boomers read print. It's a whole other subject. And, and then I will yeah. just make a little plug here for agents before I go. Mine gets my stuff right to the top. So come back and join us in finish the conversation with this. Thank you. You're watching Amador County's local television network, TSPN. It also streams live on the web at tspntv.com and can be watched on demand at tspntv.com or TSPN TV's YouTube channel. And now back to authors, writers, books, and beyond. Hi, welcome back. This is our final segment in tonight's show. Thank you for staying with us. And we have some interesting things um, to cover here in our last little 12 minutes. So I would like to start by sharing with you, I like to ask my guests for one word that personally for them describes them as a writer. And Kathy, who was on earlier, our lovely poetess, her word is precision, mm -hmm. which is a perfect word. So I'd like to kind of go around Pam and ask that first. Realism. Realism. And I, mine is receptor. Receptor. And June? Great mine words. was minor. Minor, that's right. Wow, great words. Three brand new ones. Three brand new ones we've never had. So we're, you know, we're very individual and you can see that in what we're sharing here. I'm going to go to June, but first I want to ask Pam if you, since you're the only literary writer here, if you could tell the difference, if you could explain to the audience really what literary writing is. That's a, it's a tough one. It's tough to nail down what's literary, but I would try. say <laughs> I would say in general, it has to do with the fact that you're using theme, yeah. and that is not um, always present in in genre writing, where you're really writing to a theme that over arches the story. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much you're a literary writer. Yeah. 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 It's in her blood. <laughs> and I can't, I have a hard time critiquing your work because I love something so much it's hard, you know, if, if, if like if someone wants to say maybe think about taking this out. Um, I have to really give it thought when I yeah, our I've, I've learned to be pretty brutal with my own stuff, throwing things out when I need to. Yeah, so. I'm sure we all do the thing where we, your first draft, you just get it out there. And then I do what I call the author edit, right? Print it out, I read it in front of a mirror, mm -hmm. turn my mm -hmm. back and hear it, and then I just tack away at my own work. And I give my critique group first drafts because I don't want to take anything out. What about you? Um, I have gone through the process of reading mine out loud and tape recording it. Mm, taping it. So you can play it back. Listening. Yeah. 
Although that's very time consuming, so yeah, it is. I did it for a while, but I didn't, I must confess, con I didn't continue it through the whole book. But it is very useful. Now I've had my House of Cuts um, done as an audio book at no cost to me, so that's an interesting part of indie publishing. Do you like that? It's wonderful. And it's uh, done by a Los Angeles radio personality. Mm -hmm. And when I listen to her read my book, it's just so much better. Wow. Because her voice is so good. So there's really a difference between the mental experience uh, that a reader gets reading it compared to, you know, we, I think we all have a different kind of ear, inner ear. Yeah, we do. Because I have a strong inner ear for poetry, uh, but some people don't, I've heard. So, yeah, um, it's just interesting what happens in the revision process. I, I revised this first one about 10 times. Wow. And it, I had to tear it apart because of our critique group. Mm -hmm. yes. I had a different protagonist in it at first. You might not know yeah. this. Yeah. yeah. I think so. But, and I had to tear it apart. And it, who was a minor character, a reporter, became the main protagonist in this book. Uh, and I've saved yeah. the other one character another for story. another book. <laughs> Yeah. Now, you were talking, or verging on talking about editing and how you whip things out mm -hmm. and so forth. And Elmore Leonard, uh, you know, Get Shorty and so on, yeah. he's just passed away. And so that's brought back a lot of interesting comments he made. But one of them was, he said, don't write what you know the reader is not going to read. <laughs> it's a waste of time. Yeah. It really is. And that, for self-editing, is a good lesson. Yeah, if we take out chunks and you save them, and if you can't yeah. use them, you file them. Yeah. And it might be another book another time. Sometimes they're big chunks. Yeah, they are. Kind of painful. But we get over it because... You get used to it. Yeah, you do get used to you it. You get vicious about yeah. your editing. You do. And I think, actually, I think my self-editing, other than my daughter, um, I'm, I, I'm hard on myself. You get better at yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. The whole page is marked up, and things are moved, and oh wait, my story really starts here. But all this can go, and that leads us to backstory. Mm. You know, what, uh, the, the traditional rule before with traditional publishing was not in the first 30 pages, and people aren't so much holding to that today. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I would agree, yeah. Um, backstory can, uh, in some novels, it is the the whole body mm -hmm. of the novel mm -hmm. is actually backstory. The second book that I'm working on is really that way because it's all memory and it's all um, mythological origins. Mm -hmm. So backstory just has to be present there from the beginning of the book on. Uh -huh. It's very important. Well, if you don't do backstory, I mean, for instance, one of my characters, Irene, a woman, um, I have eight pages of I could make an, a book out of her, <laughs> eight pages of backstory of describing why she is what she is uh, okay. today. I mean, that's what I'm considering to be backstory. And every one of my main characters has got their childhood, their mm -hmm. the, the influences as to why they are what they are today. I have, which is nasty. I, <laughs> I just downsized my office, and I'm back in the closet again in the corner of my husband's in my bedroom with half the closet I get we have a double closet I took the doors <laughs> off and put my my photography screen in there and I um, put my old linen boards up because I'm scrunched compared to this whole wide thing that I won't be returning to for a season and I got index cards out and went through the I'm hitting 60,000 words in this book and I thought, you know, I need to deepen some of these characters. And the president of my agency had this amazing blog on Monday. She had no idea. It was perfect timing for me. And I went deeper than I had even gone before. And I'd gone pretty deep because most of these characters are in the first novel. But she focused on, you know, we have to feel the pain. You know, we all say cut and bleed. But it was deeper than that. And I honestly thought I'd already gone pretty deep. But after two days, I went even deeper, and it made it better. I wrote 5,000 words, and it was better writing. You know, it's still the first draft. You know, I'm not, like, in love with my first draft, but she just had some excellent suggestions that I had not 
used before that I thought I'd try this different strategy. And you know, they're up there, I can read them with glasses, you know. <laughs> and the background I gave them before I felt was sufficient, but there were parts of the personalities and the things coming up that are really important, things they do in situations they get into that I hadn't defined. Well, you know, I just wrote a blog about, sort of about my characters, and I said, you know, I was writing around it, and I said, I realized that I was talking about them like real people. Yeah, and so I, I said, do. yes, folks, I do believe my characters are real people. <laughs> <laughs> and if they've got the backstory and you've presented them realistically, they live. That's right. And I think, they at do. least in a thriller, I've got to make these people live because you've got to hate them, love them. And sweat. those are strong emotions. Yeah, and you try to bring those things out in a reader who you don't know. I mean, it's... Uh, they have to love them or hate them. They yeah. can't be... That's right. ...not caring somewhere in between. So I think that backstory, at least in your own mind, is, is super important. Yeah, it's always up here. It's the getting it down and getting mm -hmm. it into the, the manuscript. Yeah. And then, you know, as, as we were saying earlier, before you came on with the social media, it's a real discipline for us today. Writers used to get at their typewriter and write. Or I started writing poetry by hand, longhand. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I have set regime of disciplined time where um, I can't go beyond that or there's no writing time left. Yeah. Do you feel the same way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that writing time should be our number one. That's right. Yes, yes. we have to keep that time. If I don't start writing in the morning first thing, then the day comes in and then I don't get back to it. I have to write for two hours or three hours in the morning, you know, to get it done. And so on my calendar, on my little electronic calendar, I, cal I put two hours, write two hours on the days that I know I have available to write, yeah. to try to be realistic. Mm -hmm. I go to my coffee shop first, ah, and then I'll come go. home, and I've, bl I've blown my downtime right there, and ah. then I'll work from uh, 10 till 7. And we all are on the computer. Yeah. Yeah, well, on the I, computer. I don't use 3 by 5s and I can't handwrite, so. Oh, I handwrote the th I have 3 by 5s I could have done it else, you know, on a page on the computer and cut it, but I like the feel of that. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah. I can't, I have to admit. Well, we're winding down, so if there's anything you'd like to share really quick that you had on your heart when you uh, came in. I'll tell you what I think is that this program is incredible for our, for authors and writers and poets. Thank you. This is really... Yeah. Well, that's what I was going to say when she asked <coughs> about if there's one thing we would like to change. I'd like to see more, more. of these <laughs> programs. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Very that's good nice feedback time. to get because getting you out there into the community and now everybody out in YouTube land is going to find out about you and your books and that's wider exposure for you and also to get in to hear you, your heart. That's to me what's real special because really our audience other than a book signing or a launch, we don't get that interaction with them. Right. No. We don't get that and that is, I think it, it inspires me on. Well, you're in your closet. I'm in my cellar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the cellar. <laughs> Where are you, Pam? In the bedroom. I, the bed. I have no office space. I'm just you. in uh, my upstairs office. What can I say? It's kind of boring, isn't it? No, I miss mine. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming. Um, I appreciate all of you coming. I wish we could talk even longer, but um, I think that we would like to hear from you, our readers, also. I would love to get some feedback from you on the show. Um, you can, um, Alan will have this on YouTube by tomorrow. You can look us up on YouTube. Thank you, Alan. And um, do a little of um, um, reading in um, return. You know, we, you are part of the reason we write. Say goodbye. Bye. Um, Bye. Thanks for coming and joining us, and come back next month. You're watching Amador County.